Hey, good evening. Welcome everybody to this extraordinary evening. My name is Justin Kagan and it is my deep honor and privilege to introduce you to our team, our panelists for this evening. I'm going to keep it really brief because our panelists speak for themselves. Collectively, they have 149 years of experience amongst them. Highly qualified, published, authored, and teachers and leaders in their own domains. I'll start off with Harriet, Harriet Davis Mustard. Oh, by the way, they're all doctorates. Harriet is um, leads up Endangered Wildlife Trust, Predator to Conservation, and she is also chairperson of WAG, Wild Dog Advisory Group. Harriet's passion for wild dogs started when she was a kid, and I don't think it's set up at all. Harriet likes to consider herself more of a conservation biologist than um, anything else. So welcome, Harriet. Lovely to have you with us from Johannesburg. Then from KwaZulu-Natal, we have Dave Drews. Welcome, Dave. Dave holds a very important position in keeping KwaZulu-Natal together where, and you're going to hear a lot more about this this evening, where population and uh, community encroachment on wild dog areas is becoming more and more of a problem. But that's not going to put Dave off. Dave works very closely with an organization called Wildlife Act, and they bring volunteers in from all over the world, young people with a curiosity for the environment. And Dave nurtures that curiosity, works with the students, teaches, trains, is the field guide. So Dave has a broad area of influence. He is um, head of conservation at Shlashui Umfalozi Park in Game Park in um, in KwaZulu Natal, and he heads up wild dog management in KwaZulu Natal. Welcome, Dave. Thank then you. from Botswana, from Botswana, we have Tiko McNutt. Now Tiko came from his native country, Canada, long time ago. It is Canada, right, Tico? No, I'm American. My wife's Canadian. Oh, okay. I got that one. Okay, <laughs> so now we have it. And from America, we've got the mix. We've got both sections of the continent. And Tico came to, to Botswana many, many years ago and has stayed head of Botswana Predator Conservation Trust. Tico makes great inroads into working with government, working with communities, especially farmers who have um, just goats and sheep and whatever they have, livestock, and finding a way for them to work with and live with wildlife. So a very important part of his life is spent doing that. But more than that, when you read through a lot of the young, um, young people studying wild dog behavior, and you read through their works, where have they done their research? They've done it in Botswana. So there again, we have Tiko nurturing, encouraging, and channeling people into the curiosity and answering the questions, the curiosity of wild dogs. And welcome to you, Tiko. Thank you. All the way from Botswana. Thank you. Peter Apps. Peter's very curious, of a zoologist and chemical analyst, put the two together and has come up with the most fascinating area of research, which we're going to find out a lot about tonight. We all know that wild dogs are wily and they are naughty and they like to escape the reserves that they're in. Well, Peter's got an answer, hopefully, to keep them in those reserves. So we're going to hear a lot tonight about female and keeping dogs in reserves. But more than that, Peter is, uh, has gone forward in that research, and when one goes into it, it's fascinating to see how he has designed this whole concept. So, Peter, we look forward to hearing from you on that particular front. 
welcome. Thank you, Jocelyn. Last but not least, our chair, John Hanks, is known to so many people in the world of conservation in Southern Africa and beyond. Very well established, has a list of accolades, which I'm not going to go into because they are on the website and they are in the invitation. But really, John, we are just deeply honored to have you here. I know I can hand over to you if your enthusiasm for the dogs and enthusiasm for tonight has been just fantastic and you've got it all sorted. So without any further from me, John, welcome. And I'm handing the team over to you. Well, thank Justin very much for those words of introduction and warm welcome for me to people joining from all around the world. It's wonderful to see people from United States and Australia, um, Northern Ireland, everywhere. Fantastic. Um, I must start by congratulating Jocelyn on a superb book with exceptional photographs. It's um, on the screen behind her, and I think it's an important book which can do so much to move wild dogs from their bad reputation of the past. And people might, might not know that um, at one stage they were actually shot and killed inside Kruger National Park. Thankfully, that's all changed now. And here we've got to give credit to an incredible dedicated team of NGOs and scientists, some of whom are on the panel tonight, who have given their lives to helping to promote wild dog conservation. And like Jocelyn's book, I think all of making sure that wild dogs are understood and appreciated, which they certainly weren't in the past, and given the priorities they should have for that conservation. But obviously they're still under threat and logically I think we should start off by finding out how serious is the situation wild dogs are in Africa and let's get the latest information on that. And I'm going to start by asking Harriet please to set the team for us. Okay, thanks John and thanks and uh, thank for your introduction Jocelyn as well um, and lovely to be here tonight. Yeah, John, the, the situation is still very serious. Um, you know, wild dogs, which are also known as painted hunting dogs, are listed as endangered by the IUC, and, and they have been since 1990. And although they were historically distributed across the whole continent, um, everywhere in sub-Saharan Africa, except for perhaps low felt rainforest and maybe really the driest of deserts, they now really only occupy a fraction of that former range. And numbers have declined dramatically over the last 150 years. You know, this ties in very strongly with how humans have colonized and, and grown over the continent. And so there are now about six and a half thousand of them. Um, and as I said, they've been er eradicated from many places where they used to occur. And they, it hasn't just been a reduction range, but also they're, they're, where they occur has become more fragmented and more isolated. And I like to think of, you know, you imagine a, a map of Africa with just, you know, colored red because there's wild dogs everywhere and slowly that kind of it doesn't just get smaller but it starts to just get disparate and separated and this is a, a serious problem um, because uh, some of these isolated habitats no longer allow for dispersal between between them and that kind of thing and so you know they've disappeared from north africa they've most mostly disappeared from west africa and they're hanging in by a thread in places like central and northeast africa and the largest populations that remain occur here in, in Southern Africa in places like Northern Botswana. We'll hear more about that from Tico uh, later on. And Western Zimbabwe and Eastern Namibia and, and also in Zambia. And the threats to wild dogs are really synergistic because as I mentioned, habitat fragmentation mm -hmm. is a problem. But what this does, they're very wide ranging species. They occur at quite low densities. And as these places shrink, it just, it creates greater and greater contact with people living along the boundaries of these, these reserves. And so you have conflict with people, you have uh, conflict with people's activities, and you also have increased risk from things like infectious diseases and other things. And so, um, you know, we, we know that over the next decade, human population projections are set to really expand in this part of the world, in Africa. And so it seems really unlikely that human encroachment and conflict with people on the boundaries of parks is going to abate um, in any meaningful way. 
And so really in future, the only, the largest unfenced reserves are going to be able to hold substantial wild dog populations of any sort of meaningful size. And any hope of really conserving populations outside of those reserves is going to require really innovative methods to reduce um, and manage conflict that, that is going to arise. So, I mean, I, I, I am going to stop talking now, but I, I'd like to say that, you know, in South Africa, we have actually um, applied some of these innovative methods, trying to make use of the, the small reserves that we've got here by managing the, the, the wild dog population in quite a hands-on way. But we can get onto that a, a bit later if we've got time. Um, thanks, John. I hope that sets the scene. Hey, you've set the scene very well, but I must ask Tika, you referred to Botswana, and you mentioned in your introduction, uh, Harriet, that the range everywhere is restricted. Botswana is a place of space, at least we think it is. And uh, Tiko, what's the situation there today in Botswana? Yeah, so Harriet's um, mentioned Botswana a number of times, and your reference to space in Botswana is, is key to really understanding why um, Botswana is really the core uh, of the Southern African um, uh, wild dog uh, contiguous population. Um, Botswana, you know, has less than two and a half million people in it. And, and so northern Botswana has a very small percentage of those people. And, um, and it consists of, of wild areas, uh, some of which are protected, uh, some of which are designated land, use, uh, land uses for livestock. Um, but this largely unfenced. And so uh, there's literally thousands of square kilometers of un unfenced habitat that um, still exists um, and supports a, a probably the remaining, the, the largest remaining wild dog population in Africa. And it's contiguous and importantly so with, with the populations as Harriet mentioned with e uh, Northeastern Namibia and Northwestern Zimbabwe. And uh, we'll probably hear a little bit more about why that's important in the context of the, the very ambitious and really important transfrontier conservation area, the, Co the Kavango Zambezi. Um, but Botswana is, in fact, the, sort of the, the ideal habitat for African wild dogs and remains um, the kind of, the kind of um, population that we hope uh, we'll see persist into the future in, with, without all of the kind of hands-on management that, Harry, that Harriet mentions that will be required for these smaller, isolated and fenced reserves. But, well, I think that leads logically into the situation um, in Shishlui and Falosi, Dave, where you're working, complete contrast to Botswana, you're working in the Umfalosi, Slui Umfalosi Park, and that's only 960 square kilometers. That's tiny compared with the areas that Tico is talking about. Mm. What are the sort of problems you have managing wild dog in those very restricted areas? Yeah, thanks. Um, there is, as you say, uh, one of the biggest problems is uh, the fencing, the small, small sized uh, reserves. Uh, you've got uh, high population density on the outside of, of and Flozy Park, and uh, it's a similar situation in the rest of uh, this region of KwaZulu Natal, uh, which we refer to as Zululand. Um, there's a whole lot of uh, protected areas, both state and uh, private, one or two community protected areas as well. Um, but they're all relatively small. They're all a lot smaller than Fufu and Flozy. Um, so yeah, they can't can't um, have large populations of wild dogs and when the wild dogs get out of the protected areas, then the first, pretty much the first thing they bump into is uh, rural communities or farmers. And those could be livestock farmers or game farmers. Um, and obviously none of them are overly impressed with having wild dogs running around uh, chasing their livestock. Um, so yeah, it does, I think Harriet mentioned some of the issues as well. Um, you've got, because you've uh, got these boundaries that have uh, got people on them all the time, um, there's their domestic animals as well, uh, dogs that may be carriers of canine distemper and, and rabies and that kind of thing uh, that the wild dogs can pick up from them. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a number of issues um, and a number of difficulties in, in trying to keep wild dogs in these small protected areas and have them as useful, viable populations. I think I'm going to ask Peter a bit later on about aspects of behavior in these restricted spaces, but 
I think what you've described in KwaZulu-Natal is going to happen in the rest of Africa. And this was really summarized in a wonderful book by David Atom, who's just come out of Life on Our Planet, in which he talks about accepting land transformation in the whole of Africa, space being taken over, natural habitats being destroyed, places being fenced and fragmented. And he refers to the most important topic, population growth. 1.3 billion people in Africa today, over 4 billion by the end of the century. That's the reality we have to face. And I think the continent's protected areas have been surrounded by people. And this has all the sort of challenges that come up that you've already mentioned that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Tico, do you see any of these problems in Botswana? Because you've got a different situation there. Um, it, the restrictions are taking place, but what about problems such as snaring? And is there a problem of transmission of diseases from domestic dogs to wild dogs? Yeah, yes, all those, uh, all those issues exist, but to a much lesser degree in Botswana. Um, for the reasons I mentioned before, one is that we just have fewer people, um, fewer, uh, just less um, human enterprise um, impinging on, uh, you know, developing habitat or, or uh, turning uh, wilderness habitats into, into uh, other human enterprises like uh, agriculture or, or others. Uh, we do have uh, very small uh, issues with, with snaring uh, compared to elsewhere. Um, we have, uh, on rare occasions, we have uh, issues with domestic dog diseases uh, that have, that have uh, made their way into the wild canid population as a wildlife population overall. Uh, um, but by and large, uh, Botswana still uh, remains kind of the, the core of where wild dogs should persist for the foreseeable future uh, as a viable contiguous population through, w within the larger landscape. And that's good. Peter, anything to add to that? Yeah, to reinforce what Tico said, uh, in that Botswana is actually typical of most of the wild dog range, uh, something like 90% of wild dogs live in areas where there are no fences that can constrain their movement. So we need management which works around the fact that they're, they're pretty well able to move out into livestock areas and cause problems there and, and generate conflict killings at any time they wish. Uh, and we need some kind of management, not only of the wild dogs, but of, of livestock farmers' perceptions of wild dogs and how they manage their, in, their interactions with them. That fits that 90% of the wild dog uh, population. And that's what we're focusing on mainly. But, um, Harry, if you, you chair the Wild Dog Advisory Group, it's got the delightful acronym of WAG. I like that, W-A-G. And um, are you, through WAG, helping to promote a concern, an awareness of some of the concerns raised by um, the previous speakers about managing wild dogs? Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, John. Um, I think, well, I think one important thing to just note is the Wild Dog Advisory Group is a South African-based uh, uh, group. And so it's not sort of a global thing. And it was really established, you know, about 20 years ago to overcome a problem. You know, we're talking here about small places that are too small to really have viable populations of wild dogs. And, but, but in, in all other aspects are actually great for, for large carnivores. Um, and at the time there were only, uh, you know, there were wild dogs in Kruger National Park in South Africa, but they, they weren't anywhere else except for a few sort of, uh, free roaming animals in places like the Waterberg, but their, their persistence was sort of also very tenuous because of conflict and other things. Um, and so WAG was set up to manage the process of, of doing reintroductions of wild dogs into suitable places like, well, like Tishlui, like Pilonsburg National Park and Marikele National Park and other parks that many people in South Africa will be familiar with. Um, and so, yes, for the last 20 years, we've really focused on those efforts of, of how do we manage this as a almost, you know, it's, it's not a pop viable population on, on, on its own, but by moving animals between reserves and managing demographics and gene flow, we can sort of mimic what we think to be natural processes. 
we've realized though that you know it go, the, the work on you know to save wild dogs takes much more than that it's not just about working out should this pack move here and can we add these females there and we have to take a much more holistic view i think it's really important to note that we when we when this whole process started it, it was never supposed to be the be all and end all for wild dog conservation it was it was making and taking advantage of the, the situation that, that we had at hand you know, we don't have big areas in South Africa for large carnivores. So let's see how we can use the areas we do have. And of course, I mean, we'd all love the world to look like Botswana, where they're just very, relatively few people and, you know, the, the, kind, the kind of levels of conflict are, are much lower. But unfortunately, South Africa passed that point many, many years ago. So, so yes, we, we do a lot of work now, not just on the management of, of wild dogs in these areas, but looking bro more broadly at how do we make wild dogs more, uh, as you say, sort of undo the negative perceptions that people have. We've recently established a whole number of subcommittees that work on things like PR and management, uh, about to launch a nice a website, and of course working with people like um, Jocelyn and others who are wanting to sort of use their skills and talents as mouthpieces um, to get the species just more loved by people everywhere. But, you know, I think what comes through clearly in all of this is the, um, as we work with wild dogs, we have to look very carefully at their behavior. And the studies of behavior is a very critical component of looking at aspects of wild dog management. And Peter, you've recently been focusing on the most interesting topic of behavior, namely, deciphering the chemical complexities of scent messages that the carnivores use to communicate with one another. Tell us, how do you analyze something as ephemeral as a smell? Well, that all sounds very esoteric. Maybe if I tell people the, the reason why we want to analyze them, it will make more sense how we do it. The, the reason why we need to analyze scents is because that's how the large carnivores organize their own use of space. And by, by having an artificial version, we can then use that to manage how they use, how they use landscapes. Uh, the answer to the actual technical question is of how do we analyze smells, is we use a technique called gas chromatography mass spectrometry, which is a, a long word that you can immediately yeah. get. Um, and for it's by first separating out the hundreds and hundreds of volatile organic chemicals that make up all kinds of smells, and then knocking the molecules apart with a beam of electrons and looking at the fragments of molecules that result and using the fragment patterns to identify the molecules. So then by doing that, we then know what is in the wild dog sense that they are using to communicate with other packs. And that is one of the first steps Towards replicating those scent signals. So, so it's some as, kind as of key bad message. Yeah. A study like this then obviously can help considerably for um, conservation management. Yes, our plan would be to make artificial home range boundaries along the yeah. along the borders of uh, protected wildlife areas, so that the wild dogs don't go out into the livestock areas where they are very very vulnerable. I'm going to ask you then, these significantly smaller areas that you're working in, do you see this, um, any evidence of already a, a change in patterns of behavior of the wild dogs? And sometimes there is. Um, Harriet can probably talk to some of the, the work that she did on her PhD and, and some of the dog behavior that came out of that. Um, but yeah, if we, if we go back to the size of protected areas, and it, it also links into the Botswana story as well, uh, the smaller the protected area, the more difficult it becomes um, for all ecosystem processes to run as they would in a big open system. Um, so, yeah, with these small protected areas, a lot of the things we find is that we have to have a good balance uh, between your larger predators and your herbivores. Um, you're obviously wanting to mimic those natural processes that would take place in those uh, larger systems or more open systems. Um, but yeah, you need a lot of knowledge and you need to put in a lot of management effort into that. Um, so, yeah, for example, uh, if you've got large numbers of lions and hyenas, so those predators that compete with wild dogs, for example, um, wild dogs are obviously smaller, 
um, so they can then get pushed into um, other areas that might not be the best for them. So, um, for example, they could get pushed into denning in, in more densely vegetated areas or more rugged areas, uh, moving to less optimal areas, reducing the, their ranges, um, or even being pushed out of a protected area if the density of, of competing predators is, is high enough. Um, but also then if you've got a, a high prey density, then these effects are mitigated a little bit. Um, so yeah, you'd also have um, other things like um, possibly smaller pack sizes than, than you may get in more open areas because a small protected area wouldn't be able to uh, maintain a large pack. Um, that's then gonna have effects on uh, the natural behavior of dispersal and new pack formation. Um, so wild dogs um, have, they get to a point where maybe between 12 months, 18 months, uh, you'll get it later on in life as well, but uh, dogs will move out in single sex groups, um, looking for opposite sex groups to form a new pack. Um, and that's obviously a, a natural behavior and a natural, um, natural thing that happens. But now if you've got these small isolated protected areas, uh, each protected area maybe, ha maybe having one pack in, that, that can't happen. Um, so as soon as dogs start dispersing, the only place they've got to go is outside of a protected area. Um, so you've got behavioral things that you'll, that you'll have there as well. Um, if you start uh, actively managing uh, wild dogs to uh, you know, reduce litters or prevent them from having a litter, for example, um, then you're going to affect behavior as well, where they would usually go down to den for a number of months in one, one specific area in the, in the reserve and wouldn't use a big area. Um, and now if they don't go down to den for the whole year, they're using a much bigger area. Um, so yeah, it's a complex, a complex thing. It is complex. Uh, I'm very glad you mentioned Harriet's PhD, because one of the things I think you were looking at was the impact of fences on the way wild dogs hunt. Now in these restricted areas, they're chasing a prey, they come up against fences. What, what's been the impact of this? Can you explain, Harriet, please? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, just to set the scene, uh, you know, wild dogs are coursing predators, which means that they don't, they're not ambush predators like leopards or lion. They, they chase prey down and they often have very long chases um, and sort of wear the prey down. And, Certainly work in Zimbabwe in this, Alistair Paul's work in Sabi Valley showed that wild dogs were actually very good at killing the weak and the old and the sick from the, from the parlor populations, for example. And so we looked at this on a much smaller reserve up in Northern Limpopo, Benicia, the De Beers Benicia Limpopo Nature Reserve. And we found that wild dogs disproportionately were making kills against the fence. And that they weren't, it wasn't just by accident that they kept running into fences, you know, they would deliberately walk sort of parallel to fences and, they, you know, they, they knew it was a barrier. And then when we, when we actually analysed the condition of the prey that they were killing, the, the prey that they killed up against fences was, you know, was in better condition than prey that they killed away from the fence. So the prey were, you know, the fences were allowing them to catch bigger prey, prey that was fitter. So this whole idea of like, you know, taking out the old and the weak and the sick stops to really function in a place where they've got this competitive advantage of a fence. Um, so it's, I mean, obviously this is only one study and, you know, more work needs to be done, but similar findings uh, were found in Kilonsberg. And I think that uh, we, we have to just acknowledge that fences have a big impact on, not just on the wild dog behavior, but actually the ultimate outcome of their predation in a given area. Thank you. I, I think fencing everywhere is coming in and it's a huge problem for management, particularly in places in Botswana. I think there's been quite a lot of literature on that. But elsewhere, as Dave has explained in Chisluwe and Falozi and in, in KwaZulu Natal, just want to make one point. We have um, questions coming in. We hope we might have time to answer them during the programme, but if not, all those questions we're going to take note of and I'll make sure that the respective panel member gets those questions. If you don't hear from us on air now, you'll get a reply um, by email after the program. I want to move on to another subject now, and that's the um, conservation literature is full of stories of and good examples of captive breeding programs to reintroduce species back in the wild. Let me ask Tico, do you think this could be an option for wild dogs? 
Um, the simple answer is no, not really. Uh, I don't believe we should be investing um, significant amount of our limited resources uh, for the conservation and sustainable populations of African wild dogs into captive breeding. And the simple reasons for that, and this is not new, this is something that uh, both Gus Mills and I argued um, uh, 13, 14 years ago when we first um, met and talked about uh, managing a meta population in South Africa. Um, and the reason for it is that we have uh, African wild dogs free ranging, the ones that Dave has been speaking about, um, that are leaving reserves uh, because fences oftentimes aren't containing them. Um, and they're being killed um, uh, in landscapes where they're getting into conflict with people and their livestock. And so there is a continuous, really continuous source of what um, uh, most um, departments of wildlife and uh, wildlife management agencies of government describe as problem animals. And uh, they are uh, of critical importance as a resource if we were looking to, say, repopulate um, uh, protected areas that, uh, where the, the subpopulation has extinguished. And so um, the there, there's very few reasons to um, invest a great deal of our limited resources into captive breeding because we have a source of far better, um, far better animals that are already being killed um, that could could service the the need for that would otherwise maybe be filled in uh, by captive breeding programs with other species. And we'll think that about one question I'm going to put you just come in now and I think people are going to be so um, excited by those beautiful photographs in Jocelyn's book. Can a wild dog ever be released or used as a domestic animal? Who wants to answer that? I uh, well, I can comment on that. In because um, it's easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go, Peter. <laughs> that is probably about the easiest question we're going to get. And the answer is an absolute <laughs> no. Um, a very few people have tried it. The accounts which have any kind of success say that they become unmanageably savage as they grow up. But the main disadvantage with wild dogs is that the males especially have a really, really strong body odor that you would not want around your house. Okay. Uh, let me so add to that. It never has been a success with domesticating wild dogs, and there is no reason why anybody would want them. Well, they're, they're cute. Uh, the puppies are cute, and anybody who's spent a lot of time with them in the field thinks, geez, wouldn't that be fun to have one of those? But uh, <laughs> when I answer that uh, question, and I get it all the time, um, the answer is, look, there are two things that really fundamentally describe African wild dogs. They are extremely social and they need to run. And neither of those two things. Yeah, the smell thing, um, that's Peter's thing, remember. Uh, the smell doesn't, uh, it doesn't enter into my, into my explanation for why wild dogs have never really worked in the few people that have tried it in a domestic capacity. Um, because they simply aren't suited for it. They are absolutely highly social and people could be their social others, but if you hope to leave them, say, staked out in a farmyard or at your home while you go away to do groceries, that's never gonna work. You get, you get a neurotic animal that's simply not gonna, not, not gonna domesticate in the way people think of other domestic dogs. Well, related to that, another question that's come in is, um, is the role for zoos in wild dog conservation? Do you want me to take that? Anyone like this, please? Uh, I I, again, I, I've been asked that on, uh, on a number of occasions, um, uh, particularly in the US where questions about um, municipal zoos uh, have, been, have been raised about whether or not it's you know, ethically okay to keep animals in in enclosed spaces and um, and and you know as difficult is it for those of us who are on this panel and those of us who've spent our time in the field uh, in natural situations uh, in natural habitats with the species um, to see them in enclosed uh, spaces the reality is that the the for example the entire north american population i believe this is probably true for for the captive population in zoos elsewhere they're all multiple generations um, raised in captivity. They've never known anything else. 
And uh, the second part of that is that the vast majority of people in the world uh, will never have the experiences that we're talking about and that we've had by, by seeing these animals in the wild. And, um, and the reality is there's, there's no comparison um, between seeing an animal, looking at it alive, looking in its, into its eyes um, and watching it on a video screen, a TV or you know, a wildlife documentary. They're not the same. Now you can learn a lot in a documentary, but the connection you can make by simply being in the presence of these wild animals uh, is profoundly different. And so the reality is if we're going to reach people across the world, you know, those people who will never have the opportunity to see them in the wild, uh, zoos still have a role to play in that, where, in that way. Good, okay, well, thank you for that. We're getting lots of interesting questions coming in about scent and smell. I think we're gonna to have to answer those by email later on. Um, I don't know if I should mention COVID-19, but we do have people from all around the world. There's hardly a country that doesn't know what's happening with COVID-19. And here in Africa, it's had a massive impact on conservation areas. Increase in unemployment, poverty, chronic food shortages in nearly every country. And against this background where big agencies are being asked all the time to put their money into um, poverty relief schemes, feeding schemes, how can we justify asking the public to donate money for wild dog conservation when there are so many pressing humanitarian concerns? And that's a question we have to think very carefully about. In other words, what is the justification for their conservation? Um, let me ask the panelists one by one. Harriet. Okay, so I think that, well, first of all, you're asking the, the right people. We all just know that wild dogs need to be saved. So uh, <laughs> there's no question about it. But, but look, over the course of my career, I've had lots of different thoughts about, you know, what, what makes wild dogs special? Why do we need to be investing all this time? You know, surely, I mean, if you adopt a, more of a triage thing, then we should be focusing on other species that maybe have more chance of making it in the really long term. But, you know, they... They're, look, they're amazing species. They, they perform in a really important function in the systems where they occur. I also just believe, uh, my own personal belief is that you know, they deserve to continue to exist in their own right. And I think they're fascinating and I think the world is a richer place with them. But, but I've been thinking about this question a little bit more deeply in the last little while. And I think re the real reason we need wild dogs is that they, they are sensitive indicators of yes. systems that are functioning well and you know we, we we set all these global targets around you know with the IT targets say we, you know under the convention on biological diversity that we need 17 percent of our terrestrial area conserved and we failed to meet those targets for 2020s come and passed and and now we're setting other more you know big targets 30 percent by 2030 and that's part of the global biodiversity framework and we've also got campaigns like nature needs half yeah calling for us to set aside half of the world so that we have watersheds and lungs and, you know, people can continue to thrive. And I think if we were to protect wild dogs in a way that they would be recovering and thriving and having the populations that Tico speaks of, like in Botswana, that would be a really good indicator that we are looking after the planet. And I think that's why we need wild dogs. That's a pretty good answer. I think I realise, of course, that we're asking the questions of people who are totally committed to wild dog conservation. But Peter, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I actually don't see a dichotomy between poverty alleviation and carnivore conservation, because the impact of large carnivores on poor rural people are to make them even poorer. And if we can manage those impacts, and we solve both rural poverty and carnivore conservation in one go. So by supporting one, you support the other. There, there is no dichotomy. Conservation is ultimately about people on the ground. It's, it isn't about uh, one lot of people in one spot and one lot of wild animals in another. We have to find ways of people and anim wild animals coexisting over large parts of the landscape. And that's the challenge that I think that's very well put. The challenge we face, I'm asked the question all the time and trying to help raise funds for various environmental projects. And we have these huge 
concerns of people um, desperate for food and help. Um, let me ask Dave, would you like to add anything to that, please? Just Probably not. I think, uh, I think Harriet and, and Peter answered it really well and, and covered a lot of the bases. Um, and that is the, is the one thing. Um, wild dogs are one of those sort of umbrella species is probably the wrong word, but because they have, need big areas and because they need uh, good habitat, I think I mentioned earlier, you need a good balance in your ecology. You need uh, good numbers of other um, predators and, and herbivores and all of that. You can't just have those uh, just on an empty landscape. There has to be good, good ecological processes happening uh, below your uh, herbivores and producing uh, all the food for them and all of that kind of stuff. So um, I think we've seen now with this COVID that's, that's shown us uh, putting pressure on increasing human population, putting pressure on natural areas and species, mm -hmm. um, pushing into those areas and increasing use of natural resources uh, with the human population not slowing down at all is uh, causing us issues. Um, it's yeah, it's a affecting disease transmission and uh, us picking up weird and strange diseases and there's all sorts of other things. Um, just in the years that I've been in Tlilkia and Pelosi, you, you see a decrease in water coming through the park, into the park from, from outside, from the rural communities outside. Um, so I think this should, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic should have, should show all of us that uh, we need these natural areas. We need large natural areas um, and we need to slow down the increase of the human population. Um, and put a lot of effort into securing and increasing natural areas and managing them well. Thank you. Another very good answer. Tico, anything to add to that? Um, look, everybody's uh, really touched on all the points. I think uh, Peter's comment that, look, ad addressing the humanitarian uh, needs of, of people um, is not uh, not necessarily distinct from conservation of, of wildlife, and um, and I think that's embodied in the concept that's uh, that's currently uh, gaining currency, uh, which is the One Health uh, concept, where we are all connected. And um, uh, Harriet mentions, you know, the importance of ecosystem health, but um, we are all connected, and um, ecosystem health is of critical importance for the long term. And what we know of apex predators and their impacts on, uh, on um, the cascading effects of uh, impacts on everything, right down to, to vegetation and water quality in regions, is is uh, of tremendous uh, value in our in our um, attaching uh, our uh, our importance to the conservation of these predators or apex predators in general and, and African wild dogs specifically. Good. Okay, and some very good answers there. I hope that sort of deals with the topic. We've got so many really interesting questions coming in, and I think I'm, the panelists are going to be busy answering these by email for some time to come. We won't get round to them all, but I do want to deal with um, one aspect. Hardly a day goes by now without information, newspapers, articles about climate change mitigation options. It features all the time in news bulletins. What do you think, what extent do you think climate change could affect wild dogs? And Tico, I'm going to come to you on this because I think you have published a paper on this. Climate yeah. change from wild dogs, what's going to happen? So we, we've done a, a couple of works with my colleague, um, Rosie Woodruff, who I believe may be in the, in the uh, uh, um, attendees to this webinar. Um, we've done a, uh, papers that are looking specifically at um, uh, temperature, uh, daily maximum temperatures on reproductive health, uh, reproductive frequency and survivorship of, of African wild dogs. And what we know from Southern Africa, and this is true for everyone here on this panel, uh, is that wild dogs where there are seasons um, reproduced in, in the coolest season of the year uh, or the, and, and at the coolest time within that season. And uh, they're very, uh, very adept at identifying um, where those, where those uh, peaks are in, in cool daily temperatures. And um, um, what, we, what we have concluded from these uh, and comparing them with uh, reproductive activity and, and success 
uh, in areas where there are no seasons, such as those uh, in Kenya, where, or closer to the equator, is that they're less successful. Uh, they have um, uh, longer inter, um, interbirth intervals, and there's lower survivorship. And, um, and what we know about climate change is that we're going to see increases in temperatures uh, and increases in daily maxima um, and, uh, and less uh, sort of um, daily uh, maxima peaks um, that, uh, that are cooler for, that are more conducive for um, the, the reproductive activities of African wild dogs. So what we expect is that as we see um, uh, climate change uh, impact our, our uh, daily temperatures, we anticipate that the effective range of wild dogs um, is going to be impacted and reduced um, somewhat. And uh, through, through these, um, these characteristics, of these variables that we've identified in, uh, in comparing equatorial um, African wild dogs with Southern African dogs. Good. Well, I think I think that covers it pretty well. One question I must just bring up here. Um, do wild dogs relocate well and settle? And I'm mentioning that, um, Harriet, I think you know about the situation in the Waterbird where wild dogs have been moved to one area, there were problems wanting to break out, they now have to be moved somewhere else. How difficult is it to translocate wild dogs to a new area and hope they're going to settle in? Obviously, a lot of work has to be done first to make sure it's, it's, a, it's suitable habitat. But do they settle in? Yeah, I mean, I, I think after 20 years of doing this, we've gotten reasonably good with the logistics and, you know, the process of, of doing this. But, but it is, it's all, you know, it's, it does ultimately depend on the individual wild dogs and how the packs have formed and whether they've, you know, connected well. Um, but, but we find that if you do move a pack to a new area and you keep it within a boma for a certain length of time, um, it, they tend to then, you know, settle in. And again, it's, it's related to, you know, how cohesive is the pack as well, because if the pack isn't cohesive, then you'll, you'll get dispersal. I know Dave's got lots of, experience with whether dogs settle in or not. Um, one of those things you don't really want to learn about. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah, some of, it, uh, some of it you learn the hard way. But yeah, it's, as Harriet says, there's a whole lot of things that it's dependent on. It's dependent on, um, in these small areas, the, the density of other predators, the density of prey, um, how, yeah, how long you've got them in the holding uh, boma for. Um, yeah, there's a whole, uh, the um, demographics of the pack. Um, so we're finding now as well that if you, Tico mentioned, you've got some of these dogs breaking out and they often single sex dispersing groups looking for opposite sex groups. Um, if you can have um, a bunch of, or a group of sisters um, and a group of brothers from opposite, from, from different packs, uh, that often tends to work a lot better as well, rather than having um, mixed age, females and mixed age males that you're trying to, you're trying to bring together. Um, so yeah, there's a whole lot of things that, that have to go into the equation. Um, but yeah, it, it works um, and it can work really well. Um, and as Harriet says, there's a, there's a lot of uh, combined knowledge about doing these kind of things and the logistics are, the guys are very good and uh, very sharp at getting the job done. Well, here's a, here's a question related to that. When you're looking at where you move wild dogs to, what thought is given to um, the impact that rabies may have on wild dog populations? Is that a consideration? Um, if you have large populations, human populations with their dogs settling on the boundary, are you worried that rabies might be a problem? Who would like to answer that, Dave? I think it's might be not. Yeah, take that hurt on me. <laughs> um, yeah, it is a concern. Um, so yeah, often you will you will have discussions with the state vets. Um, so yeah, a lot of work states vets will do in and around protected areas. Um, some vets have got different opinions um, as to uh, what's best. But yeah, you often will uh, vaccinate wild dogs that you're moving into new areas, um, and also yeah, try and get rid of their ticks and all of that kind of stuff as well, so that they go in keen and they they've got the best start that they can have. Um, 
so yeah you will at times you will have a knock where some animal you will lose some animals and yeah we've lost it i mean we lost a, a pack of 12 individuals over a couple of days from canine distemper in Kishiamphalosi a number of years ago um so you will have those those things kicking through every now and again um but uh, yeah it is one of those things that you consider um in looking for new areas well, I, th I think there's, um, with a panel like this, and <coughs> all this expertise, it's not surprising we're being swamped with really, really great questions. And I'm going to have to, unfortunately, pass most of those on and ask people to uh, do email answers to them. But I want to um, really end on an important topic. Um, in case you've missed it, Jocelyn has stated that all the royalties from her book are going towards wild dog conservation through her new foundation, Africa's Wild Dog Survival Fund. And I know that um, people have asked, here we are, we live in the United States, what can we do to help with wild dog conservation? One of the questions that came in. Well, <clears throat> first of all, buy a copy of the book. Secondly, make a contribution to this fund. But I have a question, important one for each of the three panel members, and this is going to kind of wrap it up. If we had access to almost unlimited donor funding, what would be your priorities for wild dog conservation? Each of the panelists, please. Unlimited funds. How would you spend that money? And what would you say to people outside who want to help? I'm going to ask you to give three topics in one short sentence in each case. I'll start with Peter, if you're happy with that. What would your priorities be? Uh, well, in, in time order, they would be to first invest in ways of managing human wildlife conflict so that it has less impact on the predators and on the people's lifestyles, um, livelihoods rather. <clears throat> if I had unlimited funds, real unlimited funds, like um, you know, billions of dollars, then I'd be looking at actually uh, buying up and managing agricultural areas and putting expertise and investment in there in ways which will enhance coexistence uh, and having done that there would be no need for a number three okay Tico you're on the same sort of uh, geographical area um, as Peter anything to add to that yes nope. uh, I, I would uh, I think I would um, invest uh, as much as possible into um, uh, youth education um, there's, there's just um, a, a tremendous amount to, to be gained by, by educating uh, and connecting young people with nature. Absolutely, and I'm 100% behind that. Um, I think education is very high on the list. Uh, Dave, your, your priorities. Um, if we're sticking with wild dogs and not with saving the world, then... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but uh, buying up uh, large areas of, of land, um, yeah, in, in, increasing uh, your areas that you've got under conservation, it doesn't have to be just straight conservation where there's no other, no other activities taking place. Uh, stuff like Peter said is, is good as well, where you're inter integrating, and I think that's where we need to start developing a bit better in South Africa, which is very difficult with lots of people. But uh, with dealing with the issues that we've got now, um, as things are, um, improving methods of reducing human wildlife conflict and communication, interaction and relationships with people around protected areas. And then yeah, all the management costs associated with uh, managing these small protected areas, collars, immobilization, drugs, maintenance of bomas, money for emergency response and capture of wild dogs when they move out of protected areas and then and moving them through to, to new protected areas. Good answer, and I'm going to give the last word on this to Harriet. Well, I, I agree with all of the above. Um, I think it's, it's, you know, I think dealing with the conflict issues um, and doing things immediately like making safe spaces more safe, removing snares, placing livestock guarding dogs along boundaries of important populations, that kind of thing, I think immediately is important. But, you know, I think that the fate of wild dogs is so inextricably linked to how we get financing for our protected area state. And, you know, this whole COVID thing has really underscored the fact that the way that we finance conservation is 
vulnerable to global shocks. I think that if we could put lots of effort and, and money and sort of R&D into innovative financing strategies that promote sustainable landscape level conservation initiatives, then that's really going to be the long-term solution, not just for wild dogs, but for pretty much everything. Gosh, really good answers from all the panelists. Thank you all very much. I just wish we had more time. It's um, um, our is up. Lots of questions unanswered, but I can promise you we are going to give answers to those people by email. Um, Jocelyn, final word over to you, please. Well, it has been the most stimulating hour, and I do want to thank each and every one of our panelists, you and of course John. You've managed the process as I knew you would just brilliantly. And what you have done is you've taken us deeply into your daily lives. Yeah. We come from all over the world. We, we've got this glorious idea of how it must be to live in the bush. But you have taken us right there to the, to the line. And you have shown us what it's like to live on a daily basis with the conflicts that you're dealing with. So that the next time we pop in with our, armed with our cameras and our enthusiasm, we have a far greater appreciation of what you're really dealing with. We have a now much re more real grasp of that situation. So I really want to thank each and every one of you for that. It's been fantastic, absolutely fantastic, really. And I also want to just say, well, Peter, Good luck with your bioboundary um, story, and we look forward to hearing uh, hearing about it because that, yes, more land, but we'll still need to keep the dogs inside that land. So let's get those those hormones and those uh, smells sorted out. And Dave, yes, yes, economics, yes, we've got to do it. Oh, you're working on it, absolutely. Yeah. Dave, thank you for your insight into a very uh, important but vulnerable area in Umfuzi and Shoshui game, game Park. Tiko, your initiatives with people, wonderful. And we just wish you a lot of luck with that. And again, Harriet, yes, thank you so much for your input and your expertise, knowledge, and all of you, you've got vision. and. If whatever I can do to bring that vision into reality, I will do it on the way. And John, I know you're right there with me on that one. So yes, I want to thank you for that too, John. You've handled this evening brilliantly. There are some other people I would like to thank. My publishers, for one, Merlin Unwin Books, up there in Shropshire in the UK, a small publishing house took on Africa's wild dogs and they have done a fantastic job and we really do thank them enormously. It was a risk for them and it's paying off. Also to Strake Nature, Penguin Random House South Africa, thank you for accepting the distribution for Africa and for doing the job that you're doing. We now know that Indigo Press are going to be able, uh, Indigo distributors are trading, are going to have the book distributed in Botswana. And then, of course, there is Belinda Bandameva. Thank you, Belinda. She has held everything together, or managed all the technology behind the scenes. She has been absolutely brilliant. So, yes, these are all the people that are important in the behind the scenes, and without them, this would never have happened. So I really want to thank everybody involved and not to forget you, all our wonderful attendees. Thank you so very, very much, especially those in the US and Australia who've gotten up at ungodly hours to come in and participate. We really appreciate it. And of course, we are recording, this will be online for you. And uh, Belinda has posted where it will be seen, it's um, Straight Nature Club, and you'll be able to take it from there and send it off to all your organizations. Spread the word, let's get it around the world, let's make wild dogs a household name only, with lots of financial support coming in to our unique African wild dog populations. Thank you so very much, good night. Thanks, Thanks, Jason. Jason. Good night. Good night. Good night.
many, many accolades coming in. Oh, there you are. I bet comes on loot. What's that? Oh. Straight away. Okay.